Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast, where we embark on conversations with thought leaders, disruptors, change agents, and passionate souls. Together, we'll delve into what truly matters to them. And you'll learn how to metabolize this newfound wisdom so you can transform your own metabolic health. Now let's meet today's guest. Dr. Lynn Patrick, naturopathic doctor, is a distinguished figure in the field of environmental medicine and a trusted friend and mentor to many. With a profound commitment to healing, a deep well of knowledge, and an unwavering dedication to the well being of both individuals and the planet, Dr. Patrick has left an indelible mark on the world of naturopathic medicine and environmental health. As an environmental medicine expert, Dr. Patrick has spent her career at the forefront of understanding the intricate relationship between our environment and human health. Her pioneering work has illuminated the often overlooked connections between environmental toxins, lifestyle factors, and chronic health conditions, offering invaluable insights into the prevention and treatment of complex health challenges. Beyond her impressive credentials, and professional accomplishments, Dr. Lynn is known for her warm heart, compassionate nature, and willingness to share her expertise, endearing her to colleagues and students alike. Her mentorship extends beyond the classroom and clinic, nurturing the growth and development of countless individuals who aspire to follow in her footsteps. In the following discussion, we will delve into the life, work, and enduring legacy of Dr. Lynn Patrick celebrating her contributions as an environmental medicine expert, a cherished friend, and a mentor who has touched the lives of many on their journey towards healing and a deeper understanding of the interconnections between health and the environment. What an absolute treat and honor to have someone who's been influential in my life as a practitioner and in my life as a friend and a cheerleader of the things that I'm doing in the world, but mutually so, and also just our, our deep connection around wanting to leave the place, this sort of chunk of earth that we inhabit better than we found it. And so uh, with that, Dr. Patrick, Dr. Lynn, dear friend, colleague, mentor, welcome, welcome, welcome. Nisha, as always, it's a pleasure and an honor to join you here from my little domicile in Southwest Colorado, which by the way, we've had just like the most gorgeous weather, 65 degrees in October. My herb garden is still just blossoming. Nice. It's kind of amazing. You definitely have that extended, beautiful season. And to me, I don't know, the fall in the mountains, nothing beats it. Nothing beats it. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about this because when I was looking at your bio and realizing that you graduated from Bastyr University in 1984, you're coming up, you said, I mean, that's just like saying that doesn't fit. I think anybody looking at you and hearing this would be like, excuse me, but you're coming up on 39, 40 years of practice. But here's a cool thing. You, your office was an offsite for me when I was in medical school at Southwest, when you were working in the HIV AIDS world. That's how long ago our paths started to cross. And I was so intimidated by you. You were so bigger than life and so, so scary to me. <laughs> Scared the crap out of me. Like I was like, everyone was terrified of your shift because you demanded a lot out of us. And so I just was re- reflecting on that, that yeah. lo and behold, I think I had maybe two seconds actually in your presence because that practice was jamming at that time. And so maybe just give a little bit of background about your work in that field before you moved over when I laugh, because when you and I met up again years later, is when you decided you were going to retire and be a goat herder in Mancus, Colorado, which was just a hop, skip, and a jump from where I lived. And I don't know how long that pipe dream actually lasted, but it's pretty wild that we've pulled you kind of out of semi-retirement or retirement, and you now have an even bigger mission and vision than ever before. But maybe give the listeners a little bit of that history, that trajectory, since our paths have been crossing since the mid-90s. 
interesting because so I'm 68. I know you're not supposed to say how old you are, which is ridiculous because I'm healthier now than I've ever been in my entire life. Mm. Um, and I've had kind of a broad and varied career. So I graduated. I went into practice. Uh, I had seen HIV AIDS patients at the clinic in Seattle at Bester University. And I continued to see them. And that was a big bulk of my practice. We actually got a grant from the Ryan White uh, Fund or Foundation. It was actually a, uh, uh, I, I think it was a federal uh, funding bill that had actually passed. And so we were able to create an entire clinic where we saw uh, men and women and children with HIV AIDS for about 10 years. We were fully funded. So we had full funding for 100 patients. So they were able to get um, everything from acupuncture and uh, massage therapy to nutritional supplementation. So that was a great experience for me. And I'm so thankful that I had that opportunity to see just a wide spectrum of humanity yes. and really give them information, education, and treatment that helped them. Yeah. You know, we had folks that uh, did not progress. And we had folks that were already AIDS diagnosed that did not die. So Mm -hmm. uh, that was great. And then I went, I have also worked in uh, substance abuse, addiction treatment, both eating disorders and nicotine addiction, as well as alcoholism and, and substance abuse. Same thing. It is kind of amazing what happens when you straighten out people's neurochemistry uh, to help them recover. Yeah. And then um, I did in the year 2001 dive pretty much headfirst into environmental medicine, which is where I've been ever since then, teaching and lecturing. And now I run a postgraduate fellowship year-long program in environmental medicine called EMEI, which is just an acronym for Environmental Medicine Education International. Beautiful. So that, that deep dive off yeah. the um, springboard into the deep end of the pool hmm. was a result of my mentor, Dr. Walter Crinian, doing a day-long uh, workshop on environmental medicine, and myself and my dear friend, who is an internist, uh, Dr. Saram Khalsa, who still practices in uh, Hollywood, California, sitting next to each other. And Dr. Crinian, of course, who by that time had had like at least a decade or two of yes. practice in environmental medicine, showing us these patient cases and Saram and I would elbow each other and go, oh, I saw that patient, but I didn't know that's what was going on with them. I saw that patient too. Oh my God. You know, and not, I don't mean literally that patient, but that ex that kind of example of all the chronic illnesses we know about. Exactly. We, and I never learned this, you know, medical right. students don't learn it. Nature Bathing medical students really need to learn more. And so Saram and I elbowed our way up to the podium at the end of the day. And we said, Walter, can we please take you out to wow. dinner? And we did. And we, we begged him literally to teach us everything that he knew. And that was the beginning of what was then called the Spirit Med year-long certification course in environmental medicine. God bless. And I think it started, I was in the first class in 2001, I believe. Fast forward to 2019, and Dr. Crinian left his body, and um, mm. I sort of inherited that course, and that's what I've been doing since 2019. He and I had been working together. I had been teaching in his course, in the Spirit Med uh, year-long course. Uh, I had a kind of a, for some reason, a propensity to talk about toxic metal. Yeah. Uh, related medicine and that became kind of my specialty area and then I went on to lecture in other areas. Wow. In the interim or right around when 9-11 happened I moved from um, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona to Colorado where I think that's, did I, is that where I met you? Yeah. Yeah. That's where we like re-picked up after I was like the petrified student in your clinic that <laughs> you know, hid kind of like, just get me through my clinical rotation to you moving to our neck of the woods. And we started having those amazing, even though you were a retired farmer, we started having those like grand rounds. And mm -hmm. that was like 
that was magical. Right. So I, I then had a, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Pakashra. I remember me. Bill so well. Yes. I just had dinner with him Did a month you? ago. Yeah. He's, he's working at uh, Southwest Regional Memorial Hospital. No way. Well, that's a big deal. We'll talk about that one later. <clears throat> running the hyperbarics unit. Yeah. Doing all kinds of fun stuff. So I then went into his practice and we literally transformed his practice into an environmental medicine practice yes. where we saw, you know, you know where we live, Southwest Colorado, pristine, yeah. um, you the know, outside. Mountains, Durango, people come here for vacation, except that we had two of the oldest coal-fired electric generating power plants in the United States that had been grandfathered in uh, by the EPA. Wow. And as you well know, we had, uh, we were dealing with and still are dealing with some of the detritus of that, which is Yes. Uh, some cancer clusters, right? And some um, autoimmune disease uh, problems, clusters as well, I think is what they actually are. Yeah. As a result of that exposure from high mercury coal. Yeah. So <clears throat> that is kind of how I ended up here. And here, I feel like is the best place that I can be. Mm. Uh, now, this and do you is, mean career here or location here or both here? Career here, location here for sure. Yeah, I'm not leaving. <laughs> you can, you know, so. pull me out by my boots when I'm cold, <laughs> as they say, as the ranchers say. But I'm talking about career here, and yeah. the the reason I I am feeling so fortunate is that I have the opportunity to really start to understand, synthesize, integrate, and transmit information that I feel is really critical mm. in terms of, of figuring out how we are all going to survive. Right. So right. what I do now is I work with doctors who are wanting to learn more about environmental medicine. Yeah. And the wonderful benefits of having this job is that I get to spend a lot of time looking at the research and really trying to put puzzle pieces together. Right. So this is a conversation about metabolic health. Yep. And one of the recent puzzle pieces that I think I have put into the puzzle oh. is about something that we refer to by a couple of different names. Uh, one of those names is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's on my the list other, to talk about. I love this. Good. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is called that because the prior to that, you know, prior yeah. to the late 90s, early 2000s, the major cause of liver disease, fatty liver disease was from alcohol. Correct. <clears throat> then all of a sudden, people who were not drinkers or people who did not abuse alcohol, did yeah. not have alcohol dependency, started coming up with liver disease. And researchers were flummoxed. Yeah. At that time, I'd been asked to join a, a very interesting group of researchers who were doing research in hepatitis C. I forgot that. Uh, I forgot that was another, like, lame. Was another, yeah, yeah, another incarnation of mine. Global in that arena. Hep C researchers. So, I was in Washington, D.C. at an NIH meeting on hepatitis C, and I was approached by a couple of researchers saying, we are working for a nonprofit, and we're trying to look at alternative approaches for hepatitis C. At wow. that point, uh, there were very few therapies for hep C. Right. And so I joined this team, which was uh, amazing because it was the best of both worlds. So right. I remember that the team. most well-respected conventional researchers in hep C in the United States. And then a team of us that had some level of expertise in treating liver disease from the alternative or complementary or functional, whatever you want to call it oh, perspective. Right. Yeah. And so we met for the next decade on a regular basis, every six months, all over the United States, and we hammered it out. And then we eventually wrote a book on uh, complementary alternative treatment for hep C. Brilliant. 
And I learned a lot about liver disease. And these conventional researchers were warning us in the 90s. They said, mm. we are seeing this very concerning, what we think might be a real problem with uh, liver disease, fatty liver disease, that's not caused by alcohol. Wow. Nor is it caused by chronic viral infection. We don't know what it is. Right. What the heck is going on? And so now what we're looking at, you've seen the figures. It used to be um, one in four. Now it is predicted that one in three adults in this country Whoa. has some level at the at the very least, it's benign. At the very worst, it can progress to cirrhosis. Right. Some level of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now it's been caught. The, the terminology has changed. I just got this in my inbox from the American Association for Liver, the Study of Liver Disease, AASLD. I think uh, this month, was it this month? Yeah, I think it was this month that there is now consensus that it should be called um, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Why? Wow. Because it's related to metabolic dysfunction. What? Directly diabetes and insulin resistance. Right. Which we know clinically, we saw that pattern in trim, but the very fact that they're literally changing the name of a disease process to reflect the causative driver right, is freaking amazing. Are you looking for health and wellness products that you can trust? Well, I'm excited to share with you the launch of a new online store, drnashaapproved.com. For decades, I've been asked, what products do I use and endorse on a regular basis? In fact, it's the most common asked question I get wherever I go. Whether it's a complete stranger on an airplane to trusted colleagues or just curious patients, family, and friends. So now every product that I'm endorsing has been reviewed, tried, so I gotta apply to myself first, and approved by me to ensure that they meet the highest standards for enhancing your metabolic health and overall well being. From nourishing supplements that can boost your vitality to relaxing self care essentials and cutting edge health gadgets that you can trust, that each and every item in our store has been chosen for its quality and its effectiveness. These are more than just products, they are relationships with the owners and producers of these products that I personally know of their products that I've personally used that I feel very comfortable to recommend and stand behind for our shared journey towards better health. Discover the difference at drnashaapproved.com and enjoy a special 15% discount with the code podcast15. That's P O D C A S T 1 5. I'm excited for you to see all that we have to offer to help you and your loved ones stay healthy and empowered on your path to wellness. <clears throat> so here's the puzzle piece. I was listening to a lecture by this wonderful woman. I don't know if you know her. She is a, um, a professor of epidemiology at the University of California, Berkeley. And for the last, I think they're going on 30 years now, uh, I might be exaggerating, might be 25. She has been running this amazing study called the Chamaco study. It is a study of adults and children in the Salinas Valley of California who are exposed to the highest uh, density, I'll say, of pesticide exposure of anywhere in the United States. So she has collected about 400,000 blood and urine samples, like she's getting up there with like the NIH, right? Wow. From these three generations now, looking at the effect of pesticides <clears throat> on everything from uh, loss of IQ, ADD, ADHD in children, to uh, cancers in women. Gosh. And her latest study, which was, I have to talk about why this study came into being because it's so relevant to what we're about to talk about. Okay. Um, she had done uh, 
she had looked at some preliminary, I think some preliminary research looking at glyphosate in the urine of her, mm. of her kids. And there was another researcher who'd done some animal research and published and looked at the relationship of the exposure of glyphosate to these animals' livers and the direct effect of fatty liver. So a, a clinician, a doctor, a family practice doctor in Salinas Valley called her and said, I, th I think we need to look at this because I'm seeing all these kids who are obese and I'm seeing fatty liver in these kids, 10-year-old kids with elevated liver enzymes. What the heck is going on? I think it could be the glyphosate. So he was one of the authors on the study. This wow. just got published. Wow. So what they did is they looked at these children. They had enough urine to look at the glyphosate at, uh, of these kids uh, at age five, at age 14, and all the way up to age 18. And then they looked at what we use to diagnose metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. right? which is five hypertension, yep. blood pressure waist to hip ratio, et cetera. So all the things that are really the harbingers of a change in metabolic function in the body. And what they found, so here's the interesting puzzle piece. What they found was that in these kids, there was a significant relationship, like uh, the odds ratio was like 3.4. So three times higher risk for metabolic syndrome, if they had high urinary levels of a glyphosate metabolite called AMPA. So when you measure glyphosate, yeah. you send away your urine yeah. to a lab, uh, and we measure it in the urine. We don't measure it in the blood. <clears throat> the urine's the right place to look. We can either look for just glyphosate, or if it's a good laboratory, like... Um, Great Plains Lab, I know, does tests for AMPA. They will look for both glyphosate and AMPA, AMPA, which stands for amino methylphosphonic acid, I think. Yep. Something like that. Yep. Um, they will measure both of them. Now, I just did a podcast on glyphosate, and the whole thing about AMPA was kind of like, where does it come from? What is it? I don't get it. Do yeah. we break glyphosate down into AMPA? And we don't. Humans do not metabolize glyphosate. And this is why when you see a pill pusher, a supplement company, or a, <clears throat> you know, any other manufacturer of stuff that you put in your body that says, we can do gly detox glyphosate. and Or break down the residues. 99% of the glyphosate you're exposed to comes out in your urine as intact glyphosate. Only 1% of it is this AMPA stuff. But what Dr. Eskenazi said is she said, it was amazing that what we found with the AMPA levels was so much more predictive than the glyphosate. And, and so one of the docs on the, in the lecture on the call said, well, where's it coming from? And she said, it is created by uh, organisms outside of the human body. So waterborne organisms or soil-borne organisms will break this glyphosate down into AMPA. The reason AMPA is important is because it's got its own toxicity. So I think of glyphosate now a little differently than I used to. You know, everybody's like, oh, it's a toxic and it's terrible. And it is for sure. But the metabolic product of glyphosate is probably a little bit stronger. And, and the reason I say that, and this is a study for you, Dr. Nisha. I will dig it. a very interesting prospective study of women uh, in Hawaii. And they looked in their urine for both glyphosate and AMPA. And they found that glyphosate did not predict increased risk of breast cancer. But AMPA, women what? with the highest quintile, so the highest 20% levels of AMPA, were... Um, about four times more likely to get breast cancer. Wow. And, and if you, you know, if you read studies and you look at, you know, risk ratios, odds ratios, you know that a odds ratio that high is incredibly unbelievably significant. Per, it's incredibly significant. And so 
Okay, my brain is definitely, this is definitely new information to me. I, I told Lynn before we started this podcast, like, don't, I want you to surprise me. I want the element of surprise. And I will tell you, I am surprised. Are you surprised? I Well, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in the glyphosate camp, right? And I mean, Dr. Huber is one of my teacher's mentors, you know, who's been like sounding the alarm at this for since the 1960s. I'll hear yeah. him next month in um, at the Acres Conference, the Regen Ag Conference. And it's, oh, you it's know, the man is still out there. That's great. It's huge. That's great. But this is the piece that's so interesting to me because we run glyphosate tests on virtually every patient that comes our way. And of course, we do see ridiculous levels on pretty much everybody. Um, and so we are making that causation correlation piece here. But you're saying, so we're, when we look at, say, that organic um, acids profile where we can see that a, that AMPA that you're describing here, yeah. I'm definitely thinking about a lot of oat tests that I've looked at. And oh, you're it's seeing, not in the oat. It's it separate. In the oat. It's in the, yeah, and if GPL has stopped uh, measuring AMPA, I'm going to get them to start again because you need that AMPA yeah. quantification. Well, have, do you know, there's two, there's three other companies I think of that would be willing if they aren't, which is HRI Labs. HRI does AMPA. Okay. And, I and think then, they're, a, they're a better lab, honestly. And perfect. I only say that because they have a lower limit of quantification. Perfect. And then Detox yeah. Project, you probably know Henry Rollins. Yeah. I do. Um, right. And then the other group is Kudzu Science out of Europe. Yes. Okay. So and those are. Of Europe, and they're a good lab, actually. Okay. Good. Kudzu okay. Kudzu is a very good lab. They so do what, hair testing for glasses. Exactly. They kind of look at it, the whole shebang. And so let's back, like, I want to rewind this because that just blew my mind about not endogenous microbiome changes that are impacting this metabolite. Well, there are a lot of, you know, uh, there's some really good uh, genomics tests, uh, studies that have come out saying, we looked at the entire microbiome. We looked at the mm -hmm. microbiome of the ear, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the oral cavity. We looked at the microbiome of the genitalia, the microbiome of the skin, the microbiome of the entire intestinal tract and the respiratory tract. And 55% of the bugs that are in that those microbiomes are susceptible to glyphosate, meaning glyphosate can kill them. Glyphosate's a biocide, right? And, and it is transmitted in air, water, and soil. And so it could we could make contact with it on our skin. We could make contact with it just ingesting it from other things outside, from outside of us. Right. And so are you, like in that study, are they thinking that that um, organism outside the body. I mean, that's where, walk me through how they came up with this. The, the genomics. So they're, they're looking at literally at how susceptible each one of those microbiomes is separately. Interesting. Okay. To glyphosate, not AMPA. They didn't use it. They didn't know they didn't use AMPA as a biocide. Maybe AMPA is a biocide. I don't know. Interesting. But what they did find is that uh, according to all the research that there is about the shikimate pathway right, right, for right, right. metabolism and reproduction, that all of those specific species of bacteria that we need to live, yeah. that our immune systems need, that our central nervous system needs, that our entire body needs to live, can potentially be killed by glyphosate. Interesting. So that is probably the metabolic link between glyphosate and what we now call metabolism associated fatty liver disease. Interesting. Right? And there's good there's good research on that. If you look in the literature, you'll see that endotoxemia, which is yep. what happens when you get a leaky gut barrier yep. and you get dysbiosis in your gut, you get the leakage of some of those gram negative cell wall bacteria through the intestinal barrier. They're not supposed to leak, but they right. do. And they go into the liver. A lot mm -hmm. of them get up through the portal vein and into the liver, and they start ringing alarm bells throughout the entire body. Totally. They cause a systemic inflammatory response. And that has been documented in the literature since the you know, in animal studies since the late 90s. I mean, this is not news. Right, exactly. But what yeah. we're starting to realize is that glyphosate most commonly used herbicide on planet Earth is 
a huge contributor to the dysbiosis in the gut. You know, I'm speaking with um, four, Allison Seebecker, for those yep. of you that don't know her, she's a you wonderful, know. wonderful yep. Yep. niche medic physician that has done so much work in the area of SIBO. Yep. And we are starting to really identify, you know, SIBO really is about losing your gut motility, yeah. the natural rhythms yeah. of yeah. contraction you know. and relaxation. Yeah. Yes, that the gut goes through the migrating motor complexes, as they're called in medicine, that mm -hmm. happen, you know, before we eat. Mm -hmm. Losing that really wow. is the precursor to SIBO, right? Bless. Why is that happening? Well, if you have dysbiosis in your esophagus, in your stomach, in your small intestine or large intestine, you're not getting the right neural circuitry and sensory and yeah. motor um, connections that you need to. And so we're we're going to be talking. I I just uh, actually in March we're going to be talking about all of the toxicants that can contribute to SIBO. Wow! Is that not something you know? You know when you treat SIBO, it's like you identify right. what kind of SIBO it is, and right. then you just use the treatment that is for the right kind of SIBO, and and people relapse exactly. all the time. Yeah. And again, and again, again, and, and, again, and again, it always didn't make sense to me that we're also going to use antibiotics often to treat this, which seems to further, I mean, Standard care. it yeah. is right. And so that's interesting. So a couple things you said here that I just want to unpack while we've got, got this, like everyone listening in probably going, what in God's name? Cause you and I, this might dawn on us as really big, maybe other people listening in for the first time might be on what in God's green earth here. And so when we think about in the big picture, metabolic health in general, and the terrain in general, and the terrain 10 that a lot of people who are familiar with my work are familiar with, you've already just plucked off out of the 10 specifically of just this conversation alone about this AMPA metabolite of glyphosate and its interaction, you have literally ticked off at least five, if not six of the terrain 10 buckets. So wow. you talked about metabolic, you talked about the bridge between this may be with a driver of the metabolic associated fatty liver. So there's that piece that is massive. That's the underpinning of everything. Number two, you talked about the inflammatory process that gets triggered off once this lands in the liver or crosses that gut barrier that just stimulates these pieces. Because of the mentioning of the gut barrier, that's a third bucket um, drop, which is in the um, uh, immune response, which it's going to have, which we didn't say right. specifics, but we'll come back to that. The fourth one you talked about this loss of rhythm. Okay, that's that circadian rhythm patterning that's like getting, getting rid of the rhythm of motility, the rhythm of just our natural um, cycles within our physiology. And then you even alluded to like the, the um, uh, just kind of the, the 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 bagel nerve or the circuitry, the nervous system circuitry, which is going to, in I might be a stretching this, but tell me if I'm on the right path or not. This is going to move into areas of mental, emotional, and stress response, big oh, time. Sure. Yep. And then of course the big big one, microbiome was kind of the underpinning of all this in on and around us being affected. You talked about the effect of glyphosate. Uh, causing harm to our microbiome, but it's also mm -hmm. causing harm to the earth's microbiome. And so I think we actually just plucked seven, if not um, more. And the only ones I think that we haven't really addressed directly are epigenetics, which I'm imagining there's epigenetic changes here of hormones, yes. which we'll probably come back around to because if the liver is involved, hormones are going to play a role in this. Oh, and yeah. um, angiogenesis or circulation. And so those are really the three of the 10 drops in the bucket that you've not already checked off the list. But I suspect that there's probably implications in each of those bucket items as well. I would have to think about the angiogenesis part because that's some heavy duty biochemistry that you know more than I do. But I, I think that we are starting to understand that the biocides that we've been using since the mm, yeah. 30s, 40s, yeah. Yeah. have really altered who we are as humans and have really altered our flora and fauna you yeah. know, on the earth. Yeah. And that we do have a rescue plan. I mean, we know that it is all reversible. 
Yes. Right? The this earth is, is what's so good is people are hearing this going, crap, that's, I mean, I want to come back where the, the fact that Lynn got in, um, imprinted on by Dr. Uh, Walter Crinion, who was all of our mentors um, in the field of, in, of environmental medicine. I can remember sitting in the mid nineties, um, him teaching our like two week deep dive course in this oh. naturopathic school. And literally mm -hmm. all of us were sitting there in the dark room with the slides up there and like tears streaming down our faces and like, that's it. We're all going to go jump off the building now because we're fucked. Excuse me. But that's like literally what we were all thinking and feeling. Right. And so that's where one of the things that Walter taught all of us was like hope, like what to do with this information. And his teacher, Dr. William Ray, and all of our teachers mm. sad that we lost two of these giants within a matter of months of each other. Yeah. And that Lynn, you are the one who picked up the baton on our running with it. So what say thee to what kind of hope we can create and what we can actually do about this? I think it's simple, honestly. I think yes. that <clears throat> number one, we need to figure out how to outlaw the production and use of uh, pesticides, but glyphosate, in, you know, specifically. Yeah. Number two, uh, I just did this podcast, so it's kind of fresh in my mind. And, and the first thing I did is I put up a patient's glyphosate result. And this particular patient um, practices in the Great Lakes area. Mm. And if you've ever looked at a map of the United States, yeah. the USGS map, looking at the density of glyphosate application, you see that from the Ohio Great Lakes Valley. south, yeah. it's black. I mean, yeah. there's, it's, there's so much glyphosate. Mm -hmm. All this gentleman did is he filtered his water and he ate an all organic diet. Now, part wow. of that was because he was highly motivated. He had a history of being uh, EMF sensitive because of his prior occupation in the military. Wow. So he was motivated. He wanted to get well. He wanted to get well and stay well. Mm -hmm. So using basic principles, filtering his air and water and eating 100% all organic diet, using the Health Research Institute laboratory test, which does have an extremely low level okay. of uh, quantification. Right. He had no detectable glyphosate. I wish I could say the same. Mine is low, but it's not zero. But I think it is absolutely possible. One of the things that I have seen um, in patients who have high glyphosate levels is that they are uh, not paying attention to their grain consumption mm -hmm. and sometimes even organic grains, specifically organic oat, yeah. we know can be contaminated it's probably the either, in, yeah. either in the field or in the processing facility. But there are gluten-free organic, uh, excuse me, uh, glyphosate-free organic oats that you can find yeah, mm -hmm. that have been certified glyphosate-free. Uh, the Environmental Working Group has a good, no, it's Detox Project. Detox oh, Project okay. has a good site okay. for that. Perfect. The second thing is because of this agricultural practice yep. that I believe uh, the word on the underground from our friends in the ag business is that it is being stopped because it is very unpopular, mm. is post-harvest desiccation. And what Thank that is, is that they'll pull down the oats or yep. the garbanzo beans yep. and they will then marinate them with glyphosate in the field to prevent them from molding yep. or rotting. Yep. Right? No bugs. It's yeah. a biocide. Remember that. Yeah. Uh, and so some of the highest levels of glyphosate that have been found in food are in these grains and legumes right. that are conventionally grown. Right. Now, glyphosate's not conventionally used on legumes except for soybeans, but it is used post-harvest for that exactly. post-desiccation process. And from so, what Dr. Huber taught me, organic and otherwise, because of the two-mile spread of, of soil, mm. water, and air, those organic legumes and grains are still sequestering the glyphosate in their in their um, their your, their bodies, you know, so that, which means our bodies then will sequester and we eat those. And what is, you know, we're still advising folks to eat their seven to 10 servings of grains and legumes a day, which is great if we didn't screw it up, if it, we didn't poison the right. heck out of it. Yeah. So there is the detox project is pioneering this. 
Beautiful. Is that there is a glyphosate free, not G, non, not GMO free. I'm talking about something different. Glyphosate right. free certification now for foods. That's fantastic. So that you can actually see that, and I I um the link I can't remember the link, but I know you can get it from the okay. Detox Project. We'll, we'll find I think it. That's a yeah. .org website, or you yep. can you can put it in there. I'll give it to you. Which we so, will have that Roland on here in the future. And I'd also like to get a link to the podcast you're discussing to link back for people yes. to have listen to that. That would be we'll, great. I'll give you that. Awesome. And so this begs the question though that I brought up in my podcast. Yeah. That is also illustrated by another recent study that came out in 2023, published by the brilliant, uh, wonderful Cynthia Curl. She's the mm. researcher that has done all of the research looking at what happens to a kid's urine when you switch him from a conventionally grown diet to an organic diet, wow. and how quickly do levels of pesticides in the urine drop. And Amazing. she was able to show that within 24 hours. Amazing. There basically was no uh, chlorpyrifos or malathion, I believe was the other organophosphate pesticide detectable in these kids' urine. And um, then sure enough, when you put them back on the conventional diet, <clears throat> detectable levels of those pesticides came back in within 24 hours as well, Amazing. right? Because we tend to metabolize and excrete those pesticides pretty quickly. So she just published a brilliant study in Idaho where she is a professor yeah. looking at glyphosate levels in the urine of women, pregnant women. Uh, and what she was able to show, and this there's a little bit of bad news here, so I'm going to warn you. What she was able to show is that women on an organic diet who lived further than a third of a mile away from a agricultural area where glyphosate is used, they were able to significantly drop their urinary glyphosate levels. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. women who lived within a third of a mile of an agricultural area were not able to change their glyphosate levels, right? There was no statistically significant drop in their urinary levels of glyphosate even a week or two later after they changed their diet when there should have been. Do you there was. I was just going to ask like in that, because what I, again, I've learned from the region ag world and Dr. Huber in particular is that if the soil's really sandy, it can take up to two years to leave. If it's got a lot of clay, it can take seven or more years to leave. So is it because they're just constantly being exposed to it in those the closer theory, proxy? They didn't, they weren't, they didn't have the money. I mean, the only money they had was to measure uh, the urinary glyphosate in these women. They didn't okay. have the money to look in the water, which mm -hmm. is what they should have been doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, and there was an editorial in Environmental Health Perspectives the same month this paper was published by two pesticide researchers who said, yikes, this is bad and this is not good. Yeah. But we have to go back and we have to make sure of two things. One, there wasn't any glyphosate in their water. Their water uh, tables were not contaminated with glyphosate, right? Because they weren't yep. all using water filters. And mm -hmm. number two, we have to make sure that all the all of the organic food that they were eating was glyphosate free. Right. So they didn't do that either. Right? Wow. Just Bummer. Organic groceries. Oof. So uh, that uh, Dr. Curl uh, definitely said, "Oh, absolutely. I think you're right. You know, we need more money." You know, it's very hard to okay. get these kinds of studies funded in an academic environment when your institution is funded by pharmaceutical pesticide manufacturing. <laughs> you know, that's and that is true for many, many of the academic institutions in our totally. country. Sadly. So, but what we so what we learned and the assumption is that within a third of a mile of an area where, and Dr. Curl did her homework. She went and looked at all the crops that were grown wow. within a third of a mile of all the women in the study and found the crops to be very possibly, I mean, it was a high, high chance that they were grown with glyphosate hmm. containing herbicides. So the assumption is that there is something about living within a third of a mile of an ag area where glyphosate is used that may expose you to glyphosate. And we would assume, you know, there's drift, right? It comes in on the wind. Right. Uh, there is some possibility of 
respiring that. Yes. You know, it's either through dust accumulation and they weren't able to test the inside of the homes, which was another question like, why don't we yeah. test the dust? Well, yeah. we just need another hundred thousand dollars and we can yeah. do that. Yeah. So I think Dr. Curls has a next step planned. And that next step planned is to go back to the study and find out where that glyphosate came from. Okay. But this study made the news all over the world because it was so concerning. Like, ah, shoot, we can't just depend on an organic diet to save us from this biocide. Amazing. And so, but I do appreciate that you're saying the good news is simply avoidance of the contaminant does right. a lot. And so that's so my very- patient who is living back in, you know, he lives in a fairly rural area okay. was able to have non-detectable glyphosate in his urine based on his diet choices. Probably it was really important that his air and water were being filtered. Right. Totally. Yeah. That's, I think that is, we're at the point 2023 planet earth mm. where that is no longer a voluntary way of protecting us from exposures that can harm us. So that's what we teach our doctors is, you know, if folks are uh, low income and they're economically strapped, I was gonna ask. what are the workarounds yep. for water filtration? What are the workarounds for air filtration? And they exist. Okay. That's exactly what I was going to ask because yes, in, in many of the, of the community that we serve, the people who can afford to come and pay out of pocket for an integrative alternative the healthcare provider, you know, that's a conversation to have. But but the, the the hard reality is is the vast majority of people don't have the resources to buy a good quality air or water filter. And mm-hmm. so in those workarounds, some simple things that you would suggest. I mean, I mean I've heard that even the conversation like they can't afford a high quality organic food, but I do think the CSA movement and a lot of the farm Let's talk about that. This is really important. So for uh, I get this question a lot. Like, what Good. about my low-income patients? So yes. Dr. Michelle Perro, yes. you know, who is a board-certified pediatrician and works in this area. And what I mean by works in this area is that she has a website called GMO Science where she talks about glyphosate and she talks about GMOs. Yes. She commissioned a study looking at the economic, and she had, I think, Ben Brook do it, a really high-end researcher. And she looked at, she had him look at the economics of, is it really true Mm -hmm. that a conventional diet, conventional um, standard American diet, let's just call it that, is less expensive than an organic diet. And what they found was that if those foods are purchased as whole foods and prepared at home versus going out to restaurants, which, you know, I think what's the statistic about 50% of the American population eats at least one meal away from home a day. So if that cultural shift and that education can change that and people can start cooking their own food again, which is what our grandparents did, my grandparents did, I think, Pretty much everybody's grandparents did. They went out to eat once in a while, but it was really kind of a rarity. It was comparable. So with the cost of a standard American diet, why? Because Mm -hmm. when you go to the store and you buy stuff in bags and boxes and tubs that has been highly processed, it's actually very expensive. It's not cheap. When you go to... um, natural grocers or right. you know whatever the natural food outlet is in your town and you buy <laughs> unprocessed right. whole food like we're supposed to be eating exactly not more expensive so exactly. whenever i i love that michelle did that study because whenever right. now i get that question i'm like i'm sorry that's a myth it's not true. are you a healthcare practitioner feeling increasingly alienated in a system that seems to have lost touch with its heart Do you find yourself yearning to reconnect with the essence of why you entered this field to begin with, to truly help people? If so, I invite you to consider a path that will rekindle your passion for medicine. Our Metabolic Approach to Cancer Master Course, starting February 7th, offers not just an education, but a heartwarming journey back 
to the roots of why you chose this profession. Born from my own journey as a teenager, grappling with a cancer diagnosis, and navigating a failing medical system, it is a testament to the power of transformation and the human spirit. We will dive deep into a patient-first methodology, blending standard of care with naturopathic and complementary therapies, all while focusing on true healing and prevention. Explore our Terrain 10 concept, a compassionate approach to understanding the multifaceted nature of cancer, as well as other metabolic diseases. It's about giving you the tools to not just treat, but truly connect with your patients on a deeper level, addressing their unique health needs. By joining this course, you won't just gain knowledge, you'll reclaim the joy and fulfillment of being a practitioner. You'll be part of a community that values patient-centric care, underpinned by the latest research and ethical practices. In this era of healthcare, where so many feel frustrated and unable to provide the care they deeply desire, ask yourself, is it time to reignite my passion for medicine, to be part of a movement that restores the soul of healthcare and places the well-being of my patients at its very heart and soul? If these questions touch a chord with you, please join us. Enroll today at matc.terrain.network. That's M as in Mary, A-T-C dot terrain, T-E-R-R-A-I-N dot network, N-E-T-W-O-R-K. And use the code PODCAST20 to get 20% off your course fee. Together, let's bring warmth, empathy, and genuine healing back into the heart of healthcare. I agree. And there are definitely resources popping up. If you know where to look or you get resources, you just start to look, you will find resources of community gardens that you can come and contribute yep. some, some human power to, to get your produce or, or to and get some forget that snap. Yep. You can now yep. purchase at farmer's markets yes. with your snap benefits. Yep. Exactly. This is huge. And so you're speaking my language in that we have to change the paradigm very much for people to not expect or feel mm -hmm. entitled to crappy, high processed food. Um, and the organic crappy, high processed food is expensive, you know, but it's it sure no is. one's eating that either. Right. <laughs> so that's just it. Like stay on the perimeter and then down to some of the simple things of um, hydration. I mean, that's where, like in Arizona, I remember living there, like the, like the, you don't drink the water in Arizona because of the lovely little fungus that grows in it. That's just endemic to the water. And so you see RO water stations all over the city, even mm -hmm. here in Mexico, everybody has RO water in the, almost like the most, more poor you are, the more you're going to be drinking the RO water. So I think mm -hmm. the water issue is less concerning what would you recommend on the air support? Well, let me go back to water just for a okay. second. So there are water filters that actually remove glyphosate from the water. It's activated charcoal. Very simple. Perfect. There are actually good, uh, and I'm talking about the pitcher water filters that cost yeah. $30. Okay. That remove perfluorinates from water. Okay. They're certified by... Uh, the NSF, which is a nonprofit yep. organization that certifies air and water filtration and a bunch of other things, but they clearly have the capacity to filter out a lot of stuff. Great. I just did a, oh, I just did a lecture for a course that we're doing on surviving chemical disasters as a result of East Palestine. Uh, Anne Marie, my business partner, who's also a physician, and myself got really pissed off. Uh, when East Palestine happened because of the absolute lack of guidance those individuals in that in surrounding area got to help them avoid these chemical exposures. So we did a whole course on that. So anyway, one of the lectures was how to buy a water filter. So uh, I did a deep dive on water filtration and there are good filtration technologies out there for the pour through filters. Great. Uh, Brita has its pros and cons. Okay. You know, everybody knows those filters as Brita filters, but there's a whole new industry for uh, pour-through filters that is actually really better 
Okay. And it has been, right? And so you can get a lot more stuff out with the pour through filter. You have to change the cartridge, but right. that's not a big deal. You can get, you know, 10 cartridges for 30 bucks. Okay. So and so you just switch them out. Yep. Cold. You have to switch them out. So air filtration. So yeah. this is a conversation that we have had um, the doctors that I train and the doctors I lecture to. Right. This becomes a very big deal. It is. For yeah. them, especially the doctors who are treating patients who are mold exposed. Oh, goodness. Because yeah. with mold exposure, you literally have to have air filtration in your home because even if you fix the problem, the mold problem, of course, yeah. the, the little poisonous parts of the mold called mycotoxins are very sticky yeah. and they will stick to the walls and they will stick to the floor and they will stick to you yeah. know, your clothes yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And so you want to continuously be filtering the air because the last thing you want to do is breathe them. Totally. You don't want to do that. They're very toxic to your entire body. So there is a range of filtration devices available to fit. And I do mean any budget. Nice. From the uh, Corsi filters. And the Corsi filters are literally duct tape. Mm -hmm. and a filter that you can buy for your HVAC system that you can get at any Lowe's or Home Depot mm -hmm. with a fan in the middle. Uh, there, there are, because of the COVID yeah. pandemic. Yeah, a lot of people did some per, per, like repurposed or, or MacGyvered. They were they were MacGyvered at a university and then tested to see what level of micron filtration they would have. And of course, the uh, like the 17 and the 19 uh, filters, yeah, the HVAC filters are great because they go to a very low micron level and they're able to really filter a lot of stuff out. And I know some mold docs who actually do use those uh, filters. Uh, because you can build like four or five of them and yeah. plug them in. They don't wow. use very much electricity. So interesting. from that very bare bones, go to Home Depot or go to Lowe's and buy your own, buy a box of the filters because you'll have to replace them. You'll have yes. to build a new one. You know, you've got um, four filters around the outside and a filter in the top and a box fan in the middle. That's really all they are. Mm -hmm. And you just duct tape them together yeah. and they That's actually amazing. work. Wow, that's super cool. So you can go all the way up to the top end of like an Austin Air filter or an IQ Air yep. uh, multi-gas filter, which is like operating room level, right? Right. Which also work wonderfully, and they're great. Um, oh. I, I have a... Um, how can I say this? I like the ones that are metal. That's Austin Air, but IQ Air works really well too. Um, Austin Air has a uh, twelve pounds of activated charcoal in it. It's really hard to beat that amount yeah. of activated charcoal. As I'm looking over at mine in the corner of my office. Yeah. So, <laughs> so for multiply chemically sensitive patients or patients who are in uh, homes with mold, I really think those are hard to beat just because of their technology and what's in them. But um, there are a whole bunch of other filters that can be helpful as well. And I don't want to go into brands or yeah. anything, but I think that the idea of filtering air is important. The idea of ventilation is important. Exactly. You know, the, what keep, we were learning from the way. researchers at, yeah. Yeah, at Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories is yeah. that gas, having a gas appliance in your home increases the airborne levels of benzene, which is Huge. a carcinogen exactly. in your air. And that uh, they did a study in Southern California and they found out that about half of the uh, homes that they tested the air in, in the winter when things are closed up, yeah. about half of them, the indoor air would surpass the allowable EPA levels. Wow. For oh God. And that's how well, serious it is. That's so what, What's the workaround? Air filtration, right. for sure. You yeah. know, you can't turn on your it. hood before you light it. Yeah. Right. So, yes, turn on your hood. These were all, by the way, these were all gas stoves that were unvented, meaning there was no hood above them. And that, yeah. that was the big problem. Interesting. That we don't have the right re, uh, 
whatever the regulatory necessity is for, yeah. oh, you're going to buy a gas stove, cool, but you've got to vent it. You've got to get those components of combustion of natural gas out of your living environment because exactly. they're carcinogens and they are bad for your brain. Exactly. So anyway, I think that uh, what they found out it was just ventilation was a very good way. You open up your windows. Okay. So if it's in the spring, summer, or fall, you can do that. Not in the winter here <laughs> yeah, uh, or in many places in the country. And that's another reason for indoor air purification. Yes. At least in your season when you have to close her up. Right. This is helpful. And so that was kind of like where I was going to take us on the kind of heading out here where you've given us, one of my questions was what advice do you have for individuals who want to stay, uh, you know, who got want to like just have simple lifestyle changes. So I think you spoke to those that there's a budget for everybody with regards to eating organic to Absolutely. house water filtration to house air filtration to just opening up, leaving your shoes off in the house, you know, Absolutely. things like that are really helpful little hacks that are basically virtually available to all of us in all budgets. You can and cut your indoor air pesticide levels in half just by taking your shoes off outside. Exactly. Thank you for that. EPA. And then, yeah, that's EPA research. Right. And that's so huge there. And then what role, like this is a piece I think is really important to like leave our listeners with this place because it can feel overwhelming. Anyone who's ever taken a Walter Kernian course or your course or sat through an environmental medicine conference or an EMF conference, which you are, you've got your hand in and have been like one of my, again, one of my ongoing teachers and mentors in this arena, but what role when it feels so daunting, overwhelming and without hope what role can individuals play in shaping a healthier and more sustainable future from an environmental medicine perspective? Wow, that's a simple question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw that one out there and see well, what gets stuck. Yeah. I think that I think, you know, that's a multi level question. That's like 3D chessboard question. <laughs> I think there are you know, <laughs> there, there are things on the individual level that people can do. And because I have, happen to have, I usually don't, my Safe and Sound Pro meter here, cool. I can show you that if you put, this is an iPhone 12, I think, the kind that were outlawed in France, I just found out. <laughs> if I put this, if I put it on my antenna, you can see here, my antenna, that it's yeah. going up, 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 up. Yeah, quite, so, yeah. Um, the you're wonder, wondering what I'm measuring here. I'm measuring microwatts per meter squared. Okay. And that was 280,000 microwatts per meter squared, right? Um, according to the building biology people, you don't want to sleep in an environment with any more than three microwatts per meter square. So 280,000 so, versus three. Right. So you, right. So you don't want your cell phone in your bedroom. Thank you. Thank you. You certainly don't want it near your bed and you absolutely don't want it anywhere near your precious Body. brain. Body. Yep. Thank so you. that is one thing everybody can do. AirPods or earbuds stuck you. in the ear oh my gosh. are just like having a cell phone against your brain. We can change. So you don't want to do that. We changes. We can see uptake of both glucose and heat, like it, you know, inflammation to the brain, which we see this explosion of brain tumors in in young yeah. people. Like this is you. I don't care if it's a causation correlation concept. I don't want to mess with it and find out, you know what I'm saying? So, well, yeah. there is now consensus, just so you know this, there is now consensus that glioblastomas and astrocytomas are caused by cell phone radiation. Neurologists have a basic consensus about that. So well, it, it costs sense. zero cents yeah. to keep your cell phone in speaker mode, which is what I do. And I found out that with this cell phone, um, I can put it six feet away. Nice. And everybody can hear me and I can hear them. It's yep. not a big deal. There you they go. don't know that yep. it's six feet away. And if I'm walking, certainly I'm not going to put my cell phone on my head. So that's just simple, basic, I love what it. we call uh, electromagnetic radiation hygiene, right? <laughs> you do not want to pollute your brain or your body, and you certainly never want. Oh my gosh, I see that all the time. Ever, ever. All the time. 
Yeah. So no cell phones on your body. Tangibles. Good. Good. And the further away, the better. Distance is always your friend, right? From your router in your home. Uh, I just, here's a great story. So had an Alzheimer's patient who was uh, early onset, rapidly progressing, went on the Bredesen protocol, total remission, right? Went all the way back. Wife calls, goes, something's going on. You know, he's, he's losing it. So I go to his home. Take this. Mm. You go into his office oh boy. and he's got a router and they live in an RV that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Right. So they, he has a super router. Of course. Oh my gosh. I turn this on and I put it about where he's sitting. Right. I sit in his chair and I put it where he's sitting and it goes up to, um, 150,000 microwatts per meter squared, which is the the top. It, this uh, The Safe and Sound Pro does not measure over 250,000. And so that's like having a cell phone on your brain eight hours a day, right? So oh. I said to him, you know, you don't have one of these. I'll leave it here with you if you want to fool around with it. He's kind of a brainiac, you know, engineer coming back. Yeah. And I said, but... What you're doing now is sticking your head in a microwave oven. Whoa. That's the level of radiation you're being exposed to. Oh, Microwaves about so. the same 250,000 microwaves yeah. per meter square. So he got that analogy. And sometimes people need those kinds of analogies to understand yeah. because they might, they might get a headache and not understand why, or they might feel a little brain foggy or not be able to focus and they don't understand why. So it costs nothing to get, move yourself away from your router and to unplug it at night. Yes. Thank you. Costs nothing. So that's another, you know, win-win for everybody. Everybody will sleep better in the house if the router is off, unplugged. I I love it. Are you in the cancering process and looking for a physician to support you in taking a metabolic approach? Or maybe you're feeling unwell. Despite being told you're quote unquote healthy, or perhaps you're experiencing things like fatigue, brain fog, weight gain, digestive issues, chronic pain, or high blood pressure, or maybe you just want to prevent these things from ever becoming a part of your life. It's time to become your own health advocate and to explore how the metabolic approach can help you achieve true health and wellness while also preventing and treating disease. I have trained hundreds of clinicians and advocates across the globe and the metabolic approach to cancer. But what many don't realize is that this really should be called the metabolic approach to life, to health, and to wellness creation. Because this approach can help anyone seeking to overcome chronic illness issues while also preventing disease. Our practitioners and our advocates are thoroughly trained in a terrain-based approach and skilled in supporting individuals through the cancering process, helping people prevent cancer recurrence, and helping anyone who wants to achieve optimal metabolic health. Our data-driven approach, the test, assess, address, never guess methodology, has consistently improved patient outcomes and our practitioners and advocates will use this approach to create a very personalized plan just for you. To connect with one of our terrain practitioners or advocates, visit my.terrain, T-E-R-R-A-I-N dot network, N-E-T-W-O-R-K. That's my.terrain dot network. Let's embark on this path to healing and thriving together. You just plug it back in and it boots up and it's not a problem. So I think that that is something else. Speaking of metabolic health. Huge. You know, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen Dr. Magda Havas. Yes. She presented at our conference. She yep. has looked at, Gosh. she's done blood sugar readings. Yes. Based on proximity to Amazing. electromagnetic radiation and shown huge spikes in blood sugar. Amazing. Just as a result of proximity to high emitting uh, electromagnetic frequencies. Amazing. Right? Yep. 
Yep. Well, and that's just it is like, that's the piece here is that all the things affect the things. Nothing is in a silo. There's no one, you know, target and one treatment and that goes across the field. And why I love this environmental medicine piece in my world. If I have patients who are eating perfectly, right? Yep. They're still living within a third of a mile of a, of a, of an agricultural project, or they're still lathering their bodies up with all kinds of endocrine disrupting chemicals, or they're still eating a lot of mm. grains or legumes, organic or not, or they're still leaving their little earbuds in mm -hmm. and sitting right next to their, you know, having their cell phone attached to them. I can't do anything for those patients. Well, you literally can't because that metabolic effect yep. is overwhelming. Exactly. And you can't count, there's nothing you can do to counter it. Exactly. It's and that's why I think if you and I have a mission in our lives, it is to help people understand that lifestyle is everything. It is. The and, you know, is everything. I have to say, speaking of lifestyle interventions, um, that I'm per I am right now personally extremely enamored with is um, I have a sauna, <clears throat> which uh, is a wood-fired sauna. Cool. So we actually make a little fire and we go out and sweat. And then we get into the cold plunge. And cold yeah. plunge depends on the yes. season, right? In the yep. summer, it's a nice, comfortable 50. Yeah. In the winter, it could be a nice, comfortable 35 or 40. But what I have noticed in doing this now for a probably a good year is that uh, my circulation has never been better. I'm never cold. There you go. I mean, maybe if I went outside naked in 30 degrees, I'd be <laughs> right. but, I, but, you know, let's just say it's been in the 40s. My heat's off. I'm, yeah. I'm not cold. Your body's normalized to your environment because it yeah. can't. And I sleep better for sure. And I think that's the sauna. Huge. Nice. But, but I also feel like I am metabolically healthier. My blood sugar is lower. My uh, hemoglobin A1C is lower. Yes. And I could probably blame it on other things, but everything else has been the same. This has been the only change I love in the it. last year. So anybody can sweat. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost any money. You don't have to buy a high-end uh, infrared sauna. When I was in Tucson and I, I mm -hmm. saw a lot of folks who had limited means I just told them to go outside for yeah. an hour a day yeah. in the sun or in the shade, even if they were not that stable and sweat and yep. then wash it off with a fat based soap. Yes. It's really like a bronzer. Sure. Yep. Exactly. And outside your body, right? Cold plunge, you know, I have a water trough that I put water in. I, <laughs> I put a filter on my hose. But then I, you know, I fill up the water trough. I don't have an expensive, uh, you know, indoor cold plunge. So I think a lot of these therapies are available to all of us. And I think there are just the things we've talked about in terms of having a healthy lifestyle. Yes, yes. Doing what we can to clean our air, yes. to clean our water, and to eat clean food. Those are the top three things that I think make a difference. Lynn, your brain. I tell you, we will have you back again and again on this because you have this brain that is the most amazing filing cabinet. If I come to you and ask for anything, you say, like, oh, just a second. Here it is. Um, I think about the battles we fought together over the river pollution that happened in Durango several years ago when that, you know, the, the, the mines up in Silverton, Colorado burst and filled our water with what looked like mustard water. And we made international news and our governor came down and took a big swig out of it. Like, look, it's fine even though mysterious deaths and crazy things with our pets and all the things happening after that, we're still mm -hmm. seeing off, you know, problems with that. I remember the conversations of us trying to communicate and educate our community to not drink their water and to get filtered water. And we were beat up for it. You and I were the messengers being attacked. The same thing. How many years did we try to get uh, fluoride out of our water system and our own county is one of the last in all of Colorado to still be floor putting fluoride in their water. So even when we have the data and the know-how, we are still up against a, a Goliath. And I wanted to leave that so that people know that we are not just practitioners and researchers. We're also advocates and mm -hmm. activists. And I think that's our job 
as, as clinicians and researchers today that we also have to impart the wisdom, the knowledge on this. And so Lynn, I'm really happy that you've got to impart that. Maybe you'll make people reconsider turning off their Wi-Fi at night or putting those tubes in the, you know, those, those pods in their ears or drinking a different quality of water or looking into a, a whole house air filtration or becoming, get on their board, you know, get on their community, you know, get involved in their community, um, you know, cleanup projects, et cetera. So I feel like this is just a kind of a call to action because no one's going to do it for us. And we're the best people to do it. That's yeah. the truth. Moms, especially dads, grandmas, grandpas, you know, we all have a stake in our children and grandchildren's we sure future. We sure do. We sure do. And I think that, you know, um, what you've just put out there, I just finished writing a course for the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine on environmental health, which is free to everyone. So that we're just putting the final edits on it. You can go and take the course and there's a whole section at the end for advocacy. So it gives you all the resources that you would need to figure out where you would like to potentially right. contribute. Like what can you uh, do? And I think for the providers that are listening, uh, they have upped the ante. And I think you can get, when I last looked, um, I think there are several free CMEs for the course. Oh my I'm gosh. I'm not say how many because I, I, you know, it's all being edited, so I don't know. But um, it, it was it was an interesting course to write because it's mostly from the perspective of, you know, we want to write a course for doctors, but we want to write a course for everybody and we want to make it free. So good for them for doing that. That right there. I think that takes us out. Because I was going to say, give us something for our hope chest. And I think you just gave it to us. Oh, yeah, Ab absolutely. I have a lot for the hope chest. I mean, I have much more, but I think that's a good one, you know, and, and the uh, wonderful doc that I wrote the course with was responsible personally herself for introducing the whole idea of BPA being an endocrine disruptor to ACOG, you know, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Yeah. And she spent years educating them. And they now, just in case you don't know this, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is the member organization for OBGYNs, has come out publicly against BPA and is advocating and lobbying in Congress to take BPA out of production. Oh my gosh, Lynn. These All this phenol is out of production. This is huge. Like These are the things where sometimes it can feel pretty bleak, pretty hopeless. But you hear stories like this and it just kind of gives you hope and recognizing that conversations like this, courses that you're describing may instill a desire for others to step forward and help us change the way things yeah, are. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, you know, both you and I have seen our own health challenges. 100%. And we are, oh, maybe yeah. I'll come back and talk about that sometime. I, but would, I didn't but, enter into the field of environmental medicine coincidentally. Let's yeah, see. exactly. I was like, that's just <laughs> it. So the next time we'll bring you in and we'll talk yeah. about maybe some cases, our personal yes. stories in this, because we Absolutely. both have seen and, and been this. We're, no one is immune to this. This is not uh, discriminating for your socioeconomic education, you know, religion, political affiliation, skin tone. The environment, as, as Walter once said, it's no longer a matter of, matter of if we're toxic, it's how bad is it, <laughs> you know, yeah. and how does it interact within our own terrain? And so you, you gave us a lot to think about. Um, you gave us some things to be hopeful for and to get involved with, and we would definitely love to have you back. But Lynn, as always, you continue to inspire me, you continue to teach me, and you continue to just impress the hell out of me. So thank you for who you are and all you do. And let's keep up the good fight. And I can say the same for you, my dear. You know, you are uh, a magic, how can I say this? You are majestic in your presence uh, as a healer on this planet and also as a changer, right? Like we are out to change yeah. things, you know, and we're talking about from the highest levels of government down to our communities. We're up for that. You know it. Thank you for being on this journey with me. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Metabolic Matters. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and empowering. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team and supporters who make this podcast possible. First, we'd like to thank our production team, Alex Sanchez, Cindy Kennedy, Jessica Gilman, and Lynn Hughes for their hard work behind the scenes. Our theme song was written by Julie Newmark and performed by Whiskey Flower. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and being a part of the Metabolic Matters community. Do you want to learn more? Please visit our website, metabolicmatters.org, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help support our mission, spreading awareness and knowledge about metabolic health, reach out. We'd love you to join with us. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on upcoming episodes. We have so much exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay empowered, and remember, your metabolic health matters.